This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. And welcome to this Razor COVID-19 special, where we begin to take a glimpse at what life might be like after COVID. The focus during the pandemic has been on saving lives. Now governments are turning their attention to economic recovery. But there are positive signs the crisis could be an opportunity to explore a greener, more sustainable future. The coronavirus pandemic has caused hardship and tragedy across the globe. But as the pollution cleared from our skylines, climate scientists say a mental shift they have been waiting for has also occurred. The virus immediately shifts priorities, doesn't it? You might have thought would have led to many people thinking, well, climate change is not a priority now. But um, I think there's also a recognition that this is almost um, a, a warm up for the bigger problem. Like the pandemic, it's probably going to kill over a million people, but this is trivial compared to the scale of the damage that could come from uh, climate change. It comes slower, but we, 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 it's going to take us longer to get ready. Cameron Hepburn is a professor of environmental economics. This is a, a huge moment in how we reshape the economy because there'll be, there's already 10 trillion roughly US dollars of spending that's gone out the door to rescue companies to protect livelihoods around the world. And there's more of that coming. And how that's invested will have a huge impact on whether we create an economy that's fit for the future or one that's still based upon some of the more fragile and dangerous elements of the, the economy that we currently have. A recent study that looked at daily emissions of greenhouse gases and pollutants highlighted key focus areas. Professor Corinne Lequere was the lead author. We don't uh, normally uh, keep track of daily emissions around the world. We keep track on an annual basis. So when the pandemic started, we had to develop new methods. And what we found is, in fact, that emissions dropped quite a lot. On, uh, at the peak of the confinement, so that was early April on the 7th, emissions had uh, dropped by 17% worldwide. And by the countries that were under lockdown, then it was between you know, 25 and 30%, even a little higher for the extreme lockdowns. So the difference between doing it annually and doing it daily is that you were able to, to really hone in on those different sectors, is that right? Absolutely. And by doing it daily, then we could see, in fact, where were the decrease in emissions coming from. And the biggest factor was road transport, and that accounted for the biggest share. So 43 percent from road transport. And unfortunately now, well, not unfortunately, because the confinement measures are eased, but it also means that the emissions, particularly from road tra transport, are now back up, not quite to pre-COVID level, but not far off. There was a drop of most greenhouse gases and pollutants, but carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for over 100 years, so the drop in emissions won't do much to slow climate change. What's the significance of real-time data? I mean, how does it help our climate change policy going forward? It helps to understand where the emissions are coming from. It helps to understand what you can do. So because road transport responds very quickly, we now know that governments, if they put policies in place, then you could have a change in emissions very rapidly. It also helps to see that some other sectors like power or industry were a lot slower in changes and therefore you need to put measures that are very uh, structural to make sure that these sectors can also uh, reduce their emissions in the long term. According to the World Meteorological Organization's climate report on the last five years, more urgency is needed. During the past 20 years, we have seen the 19 warmest years on record. As habitats are destroyed, the chance of COVID-type pandemics increases with greater interspecies contact human health depends on a healthy climate. In terms of climate change, uh, do you feel that the pandemic has given us hope? Is that correct? I wondered why you, why you think that. The optimistic view of which, which I'm sharing is, 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 is showing that uh, 
that many countries are, are, are now uh, interested in investing in, in, in climate friendly technologies. And that's, that seems to be happening in European countries, so many European governments and also European Commission has decided to proceed with this green deal and, uh, and they would like to invest in climate friendly technology as part of the recovery package and, and also that, that has been happening in Canada, for example. This uh, uh, some sort of uh, passion that we have had to, 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 to fight the pandemic, uh, if we could uh, conserve a fraction of that passion and, and start uh, fighting against climate change, uh, that would be good news. Past recessions have seen an increase in industrial activity, but after the 2008 financial crash, there was also green investment. We saw kind of 15, 20% in some cases, some cases a bit higher, of green response. That was, I think, a low watermark, actually. And we'll see much stronger green responses this time uh, for the reason that the world's ready. We're ready because the Paris deal provided the institutional architecture uh, and every country, every single country in the world has had to submit a plan into the UN. It's called a nationally determined contribution. And the other point is that now, compared to uh, 10 years ago, the public are much more on board with this. There are strong majorities in all the big economies for a green recovery from the pandemic. And the politicians, you know, if nothing else, they're good at sensing political opinion. Professor Cameron Hepburn co-authored a recent report that highlighted pandemic recovery policies that could positively impact the economy and climate. They included clean infrastructure, building efficiency and regenerating ecosystems. All will create jobs. But the report also warned we could go from the COVID frying pan into the climate fire. With so much money coming through government spending to stimulate these economies, you know, as I say, it's already a scale of 10 trillion and global GDP is, is 80-ish trillions. Now, if that investment is fossil fuel infrastructure, that's long lived, then, you know, to use a non-technical term, we're stuffed. And the reason is that we already have enough fossil fuel infrastructure to take us well over two degrees. To limit the global temperature to 1.5 to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels, this brief drop in emissions must continue. Depending on, on how the rest of the year plans out, the drop in emission over the full year could be you know, of the order of four to seven percent decrease. And if we wanted to tackle climate change along uh, with the most stringent commitments, then we'd have to do that kind of decreases every year. So it does show uh, the size of the effort that we have to put in place uh, to tackle climate change. Some countries are reopening their borders to international travel, which means airlines must reduce the risk of infection. Professor Chin Yan Chen and his team from Purdue University have modelled different scenarios of how droplets can circulate in air cabins to allow for safer designs for future travel. The simulation we showed that the mouth was not covered and therefore it was a very powerful car, it could go very far. But you also see our other animations. When you would put just a tissue or a hand or a fist, you know, or elbow, you can reduce the travel distance of those droplets a great deal. And by doing that, you know, the droplet wouldn't go like two meters. It might just be like one meter or less than one meter. Ventilation systems on most commercial airlines are specifically designed to circulate air. Air in the cabin is refreshed every four minutes through HEPA, or high efficiency particulate air filters, which according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, removes 99.9% .9 of all germs. But within those four minutes, air has usually mixed across three rows in front and behind possibly even as much as five to seven rows if people have been moving along the aisles. So you can see that the cough or talk, the droplet is go up to the uh, ceiling level. Then the ventilation system brings it down along the walls of the window. 
and to the floor level, and then it could really go to the other side of the aisle, and then finally form this mixing condition, which means uh, the seat next to this uh, sick passenger is a very high risk seat. But you also see from this seat map, passengers sit as far as the seven seat could get infected. So we also suspect that the, the, the wake caused by a walking passenger or a walking flight attendant could bring these particles very far. Professor Chin Yan Chen and his team have designed a new ventilation system that doesn't mix the clean air in the cabin. Rather than from above, it's supplied from below, directly into your breathing zone. Then, when you breathe out, the contaminated air rises and is extracted at ceiling level. So as a result, you are not sharing the air with your uh, neighboring passenger. With our new design, we anticipate that we could reduce the risk of infection by about 50%. Something I hope that the um, airplane manufacturers are willing to implement. I was interested to note the study you did on the toilets. The evidence has already shown that a sick patient, when they go to the toilet, the stool and the urine contain the coronavirus. Now in an airplane, the toilet is designed in such a way they can vacuum very hard. So if you don't close the toilet lid, and those small droplets will get into the air. And of course, when this sick passenger leaves the toilet, and another passenger enter into the toilet, and that's very dangerous. So it's very important you should keep the toilet lid down when you flush just for the benefit of fellow passengers. Boeing uh, has uh, worked with other people, try to use UV light to kill the germs in the toilet. And I believe that's a very good measure and that will help. So when we're back on planes, how will things be different? As you can see, the most of US major airliners are asking passengers to put masks on and some of them also leave the middle seats open. And I think this is a very important first step for the airliners uh, to take those measures to mitigate the uh, risk. I have to say that nothing is bulletproof. When you travel, you always have a risk. And risk is not only occurs in the air cabin. It could occur in the terminals, could occur in the buses or the subways. We hope that the airliners will take proper measures as I have described here. And this will be very important for building the confidence and the passengers. It's a disease that could attack anybody. Life under lockdown. And I'm Rahul Pathak. It comes Madrid, as a shock to all of us. So I'm in home isolation. I'm Isabel Ewing in Budapest. We have a simple message for all countries. Test, test, test. After schools shut their gates from Friday. We are accelerating research. I said very clearly there's more to do. Develop a vaccine. You were the oldest person to have survived this nasty virus. Thank you so much for all you people.
Large gatherings and sporting events that went ahead before lockdown are thought to have caused local spikes in infection. However, recent images of busy beaches and Black Lives Matter protests have shown that people are starting to feel like they can be in a crowd again. But there is a way of analysing our behaviour and evaluating how we can safely gather in large numbers. Anytime we get large numbers of people together, there is of course always a risk of transmission. The Black Lives Matter movement, and in particular about police violence against black and minority ethnic communities. This is something that we also consider to be a public health problem. Having said that, we are of course still in a global infectious disease pandemic caused by the new coronavirus. And it's really important that if, if people feel like they want to take part in these protests, we make these as safe as possible. Now the upside is lots of these protests, or most of them are taking place outside. And this probably does reduce transmission risk significantly because any particles that come from your nose or mouth will quickly dissipate into the atmosphere where they won't hurt anyone. I think that it's important to note that anytime you get large numbers of people together, it will never be a no-risk situation. It turns out that managing crowds is called crowd dynamics. Paul Townsend runs a company that models crowds at events and in venues in public spaces. We define a crowd as anywhere where a certain number of people are gathered together because we deal with pedestrian crowds such as on shopping streets where they don't have a common purpose, uh, there's individual groups that are moving around. And we also deal with large crowds such as in Mecca with three million people gathered together, um, all who have a very common purpose and set target. And the simulations that we use, essentially dots moving around on a screen, they all have a certain behaviour where they don't want to come close to other people or close to other objects. And collectively, that defines how crowds might move in a certain density, at a certain speed. We tend to look at a protest like we look at any other event, people are gathering for a purpose. But it means that we can simulate certain behaviours of the crowd. For example, if they're trying to go past a line of police officers that are asking them to stop, we can actually simulate the impact and build-up of a crowd in that situation which will give the police officers much better awareness of the situation before it even happens. Crowd dynamic software is usually used to predict movement and optimise layouts to avoid overcrowding. It's very difficult to know what a single person's going to do. We can start to understand that the emergent behaviour of a crowd of people altogether is predictable, whereas an individual given all the psychology we have as individual humans, is much less so predictable. I'm sure anyone who's been to a supermarket in the crisis, especially earlier on, knows that there was a new way to shop and uh, you can actively see people steering around one another. It certainly affected how we visited public spaces where we've seen people doing exercise, actively avoiding people that they would have just brushed past before, people sitting much further apart in parks, and so on. Crowd dynamics can factor in these behaviours to help organisers plan future sporting events, music festivals, or any big gathering of people with the pandemic in mind. Is there a basic list of the changes that will have to be made as a result of COVID to your algorithms? Uh, there's various different models that we use in different situations depending on whether it's a, a very large widespread area where we don't need to look at the crowds in so much detail or having individuals in the model that are moving but seeing the crowd behavior that comes from that and we've put in certain ways to measure when people are within two meters within the models so that we can then consider in certain situations what the best new design might be or the best management might be how is that going to change the way we live going forward because are we now moving into an era where we can't go to festivals and pop concerts and theatres or even shops in the way that we used to? And with the venues currently reopening, as more and more entertainment venues or attractions, museums uh, or even concerts start to reopen, I'm sure immediately we'll see a very different way of attending them because people are trying to keep further apart. 
it's also affected how people are assessing the capacity of these venues. How many people can I get in a shop or a festival? There's a whole mix of ways that they're doing that. But I think even beyond the current two metre rule, even if that goes to one metres, uh, or there's some different guidance, the actual behaviour of the crowds is still going to be different for a certain period. We don't know how long that period is. I think we're going to find that, in general, the space available is going to increase at some of these events. So the space per person available will increase somehow. And as government policies change and as the science behind how the virus uh, might spread and what's actually needed changes, um, that'll determine what that actually looks like. But this will get back to what we consider to be a normal crowd at some point in the future, but we don't know when. And that means in that interim period, we need more research to be done right now, actually, to determine what normal is now for crowds. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter. We bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. When we think about life after the pandemic, we soon find ourselves in the realm of social science. COVID-19 required many of us to move from the workplace into a virtual office at home. That brought challenges, but it also brought insights into how things could be improved in a post-COVID world. But even before the virus, one New Zealand boss changed to a four-day working week and says going back to our old ways after the pandemic would be a wasted opportunity. As lockdown eases, people are spending more time outside but office blocks remain almost empty. COVID-19 has forced us to experiment with new ways of doing business, a change that's well overdue, says businessman Andrew Barnes. I think the way we work today, even before COVID-19, it isn't fit for purpose. It hasn't been fit for purpose for a while. We haven't changed you know, the nine to five, five day week since broadly the 1920s. All the surveys, even pre-COVID, indicated that people were anxious to try and find a different way of working. All COVID-19 will now do, I think, is accelerate that process. In New Zealand, Barnes Estate Planning Services Company, Perpetual Guardian, was quickly able to adapt to the coronavirus challenge. In 2018, he decided to trial a four-day working week after reading an article about how poor productivity was in a typical five-day week in the UK and Canada. We found our stress levels dropped about 15%. Our engagement scores, that's enthusiasm, enrichment, empowerment, they all went up about 40%. But critically, productivity went up as well. So in fact, we were delivering the same amount of productivity in the four days as we were in five. And in fact, more people said they were better able to do their work working four days rather than five. And we call this the 180-100 rule, which is 100% of your pay, 80% of your time, provided we get 100% productivity. So how did the changes that you implemented before the virus help during lockdown in New Zealand? Well, I think the key problem that people had when they sent their staff home was you had to have trust. You had to trust your employees that they would work, you know, I know of some companies that made their staff keep Zoom on all day so that they could be seeing whether their workers were working. Um, and at the same time, you had to be able to measure productivity. Now, one of the problems historically has been, especially in service industries, is we have no idea how to measure productivity. 
The benefit we had is that as part of the process of moving to four day week, we had worked out what productivity was. We'd asked our staff to tell us how we should measure them. We ver verified that. And we built up this incredible level of trust. So for us, shifting to homeworking really was no issue at all. We have seen absolutely no change in our company performance through the lockdown. In the UK, a group of cross-party politicians is now urging the government to explore the economic benefits of a four-day week as a way to recover from the COVID-19 crisis. And the perpetual story has run in over 80 countries, with so many requests from media, businesses, academics and politicians, Andrew and his partner Charlotte Lockhart set up the four-day week global, and the pandemic has seen another wave of requests for guidance. Do you think COVID's now going to hasten more change, such as a four-day work week, uh, in, in business? People say to me, what is, you know, what is the biggest obstacle for business doing that? And I would always say fear. They fear management were fearful of doing something that was significantly different, or in their perception, was significantly different. Um, and they also feared being able to trust their staff and be able to measure their productivity. So now that we've done that, we've taken that leap of faith, what was forced on us, then how do we actually find a, a new way of working that says, OK, you know what, let's be a lot more flexible. Now, how do you operate um, within New Zealand law uh, in terms of the contracts? How does that work? There are some problems with the fact that in New Zealand, and as is in a lot of places around the world, uh, we, our employment contracts are based upon a place and times and days of work. So what we did is we actually haven't changed our staff and contracts. We have uh, we have an opt-in process, so people opt in on an annual basis to the productivity. We call it the productivity week because it is a focus on productivity. If you can be more productive, you can have time off. And so we have an opt-in contract that sits alongside your employment contract. The four-day week encouraged a more flexible, adaptable way of working. And the pandemic has shown companies that business can continue outside an expensive centralised office. Lockhart says this new way of working doesn't need more legislation, but governments do need to play a role. So my view is that the sort of things that we, need, we want government to be doing is making business accountable to the way that they measure their outcomes, the way that they measure and report what they do. So for example, in the UK, businesses have to report on their gender and diversity statistics. Well, what if we had to report on our employee wellbeing statistics? What if we had to report on our environmental impact? And all of the things that reducing the number of hours that we work, all the benefits, all the side benefits that, they, that if companies had to, to report on it, then they would look for mechanisms to give them those things to improve their reporting structure. What changes do you hope that the world might take on board? I mean, in business, but maybe elsewhere as well after this pandemic? So I am really hopeful that we will come out of this actually absolutely rethinking the way we work. I hope and pray that a four day week will be part of that because it addresses a lot of these key issues you know, around equality in the workplace, gender pay. It addresses the bigger pandemic, arguably, in the world, is mental health. One in four or one in five of your workforce at any point in time have a stress or a mental health issue. And that is often occasioned by, you know, things like work, the amount of time you're spending on commute and so on. So I am hopeful that from this, we will actually rethink there are good things that have come out of the lockdowns. The tragedy will be if all we do is go back and do exactly the same thing as we did before. That's it for this Razor COVID-19 special. Join us again next week when we'll continue to look at what it may be like in a post-COVID world. Stay safe, look after each other, and we'll see you again next time.